singing church you may be seated we're going to take the next couple of minutes to pray quietly in our seats um, I'll open us up and then you guys will have a couple minutes to pray let's pray together dear heavenly father the lamb who was given and slain for our pardon even though we are unfaithful weak and unstable because of you, we are not alone, Jesus. Thank you for that. Thank you for the chance to come together and rejoice in that as one. Thank you for the season where we get to spend time intentionally rejoicing in your birth, in your life. I pray that this morning is all for your glory, all for your honor, and not any for our own. In your name, amen. Jesus, there's so much that tugs at our attention. There's so much that challenges us in our lives. And you are the solution, Lord. You're the one we're made for. So I pray in these moments you'd help us to remember that or to learn that, maybe for the first time. May these words be yours and not my own. In the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. 
It is good to be worshiping with God's people. Uh, if you are new here, I'd give you a, an extra warm welcome and, and invite you to come and, and see what's going on here. And if you don't know me, my name's David. I'm the teaching pastor here at Hall Center Church. And we are in our fourth week of our holiday sermon series called Surviving the Season. And today we're going to talk about the greatest being, the greatest being. I would like to kind of before we get into that, uh, I would like to thank those of you who endured patiently and graciously last week. Um, there are kind of two elements there. One, we tried a Q&A that um, didn't necessarily do the best job at conveying what we wanted to convey. It may have gone a bit long, so I thank you for those of you that patiently endured that. And also, we've been having some sound issues because a team put in a lot of hard work to upgrade our system, and it has a mind of its own. So I, apparently, I sounded like I had a lisp last week. I was told that. I don't know if that's true. But thank you for enduring with these hiccups. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to get sucked into pinning our worship experience on the quality of the trappings of that experience. But really, worship is between us and God and between us and God's people. So just thank you for enduring these things. You know, we find ourselves here in America, here in our lives, surrounded by a cast of characters. So I just have a little game I'd like to try out with you guys, if you're willing to endure a game. Usually when I do this, it doesn't go well. This one's way easier, okay? Way easier. So who's that? Ronald McDonald, right? They don't use him anymore because he's a clown and clowns are creepy, but, right, if you're over the age of five, you probably know who that is. The next one, the Geico Gecko, right? It's just a lizard, and yet you guys know what it is, and you, you know that 15 minutes or more could save you, you know, whatever, 20% or more. I guess I don't remember as well as I thought I did, but uh, the next one, the Michelin Man. Okay, why is there a mask off for tires? Well, there he is. He exists. This one, we all know this one. Mickey Mouse. The Easter Bunny, you guys are a little bit more uncertain about that one. Why is it that almost every portrayal of the Easter Bunny is creepy, right? I, I at least find them creepy. And then, of course, Santa, right? And this is just a small, you know, subsection of all the characters that we could go through. I mean, we could be here for days going over all the different characters that we use to celebrate in this culture, and especially the characters that are used to advertise various products, like even insurance companies, entire companies have mascots. And I did a little bit of research into this. And, and one of the basic reasons is that people buy stuff more consistently if there's a character or a mascot involved. I know that seems kind of silly, and as, as adults, we might think, well, we don't need characters. But it actually has something psychological going on in there that it builds um, loyalty to the brand, right? Because it's not just an object. Right? It's not just an object, so maybe you have a loyalty around, you know, Sam the Toucan, and so you keep buying Fruit Loops rather than the off-brand, even though it's the same thing, right? Because you maybe saw the advertisements when you were a kid, and there's some loyalty to that character. You've connected with that character. They actually did a study at a, at a technology auction, and people consistently paid more for tablets that had a smiley face on their screen during the auction than ones that didn't. It's really interesting when we get into it. We as human beings really connect with characters, and they're used in the marketing around us. This is one of the reasons people are willing to spend so much money at Disney World, right? There are a bazillion other theme parks, but really when you go to Disney World, it isn't about the rides. It's about the characters. It's about loyalty and enjoyment of those characters. And so in Christmas time, we find ourselves surrounded by a slew of characters that have been tailored and produced so that we will buy more stuff. I mean, you know those chocolates that, that are wrapped in tinfoil? They're either shaped like Santa or the Easter Bunny. Why is it that those are the worst chocolates? Right? You know it's going to taste like a crayon. It does. That's the crayon chocolate that they put in those. And yet people still buy them. And they don't sell them during the rest of the year because it's not good. But because it has a character on it, every year people go, oh, I remember having that when I was a kid. And so they buy it again. 
It's really interesting how all of these characters are used by businesses to drive sales. And so we're surrounded by this slew of characters around Christmas time. And it can get kind of overwhelming. Now, I'm not here to attack characters, okay? I just want to be clear, all right? Don't hurt me. I'm not here to target characters. Characters can be a good and wonderful thing we can give thanks to God for. But the danger here is that Jesus can become just a side character in a cast of imaginary and mythical consumer mascots. I'm sure we've all experienced that around Christmas time, especially when there are kids in the home. It can be very easy to get sucked into all of these cool and fun stories. So that Jesus, he's just a little figurine somewhere in the house. He's just, you know, maybe one in ten songs that come on the radio. That often Jesus becomes a side character in Christmas. So today we're going to see that Jesus is not a side character. That our hope comes from Jesus as the greatest being in existence. So turn with me to Colossians 1. And you might be thinking, haven't we already been there? Yes, we have. So we've already been through, if you've been with us, we've been in the series uh, in through the book of Colossians. And so Steve already did the work for me. I just got to, you know, take some of his notes. And we're just going to do kind of a recap of this passage. So we're not going to spend as much time in it as, as we normally would. But in Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, writing to some Christians, starting in verse 15, speaking of Jesus, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus perfectly reflects who God is because he is God himself. He's the perfect image of God's character. He perfectly reveals who God is. That the fullness of God, all of it, not some of it, not most of it, all of it can be found in Jesus Christ. And so that means that Jesus made all things. He's the very same God who created everything. Not only did he make it, he didn't just make it and run away, but God made it for himself. He is an active and he is an involved God. And he didn't just make the visible things, he also made the invisible things. Whether that be little particles and and elements that we just really can't fully understand or notice yet, or the spiritual world, he has made it all by his power for his glory. He was before it all. And this God holds everything together. He is the firstborn from the dead. Now, that does not mean that Jesus was born, but he is the heir of all things. And we know, reading the Gospels, that God himself, Jesus Christ, came down in human form. He suffered and died. He took the wrath of God on the cross for us. So if we put our trust in him, we are forgiven. We're forgiven by the judge of the universe. But Jesus didn't stay dead, right? That's the good news that we celebrate on Easter, that Jesus did not stay in that grave, but he rose from the dead. And we put a lot of trust in that. We go, well, Jesus rose from the dead, so we know he's the real deal. But it also means that if we put our trust in him, we will be raised as well on that final day. He is the firstborn from the dead. We are the ones to come afterwards. And this passage speaks of Jesus reconciling all things to himself, making peace by his blood, that our God is in the business of fixing this mess. There's a lot of mess around us. 
There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of brokenness. There are a lot of health issues. There's a lot of grief. And yet Christ's sacrifice is the turning point in human history. Like God is calling his people to himself. And one day he is coming back and he will make all things right. That God is bringing peace. And it's interesting in the verses to follow, um, the verses selected, The Apostle Paul makes the point to his listeners. He says, look, you were far from God too. You were disobedient. You were broken. And yet God has reconciled you to himself. In both these instances of reconciliation, the word means a full and complete reconciliation. To fully have that relationship restored. Jesus is not a side character. Our hope is comes from Jesus as the greatest being in existence. You know, so often we boil down who Jesus is to a formula, right? Especially if you were taught evangelism, you were taught to explain Jesus using this verse and that verse. And hey, Jesus died for you. Are you going to put your trust in him? But he's bigger than that. He's the God who made all things. He's the greatest being in existence and he is restoring all things. I want you to imagine with me for a second that you're at a wedding. And if it helps you, you can even imagine that it's your wedding. Not your actual wedding that may have taken place in the past, but an imaginative, strange wedding. You'll see why it's strange in a moment. You show up to the service. And the people really don't seem that excited to be there. And so you you and your spouse, well, soon-to-be spouse, you, you go down the aisle and people are just kind of standing around. They seem, you know, kind of pleased that they're there. But there's not a lot of fanfare, not a ton of excitement. They're just kind of going through the motions. And so you go through the ceremony and you go, that's kind of weird, but maybe people are just tired. Maybe they're tired from traveling. And so then you go to the reception. And that's where things really take a turn. Because you walk into the reception and you would let your family deal with all the details. You didn't want to have a hand in any of it. And you walk into the reception and rather than have a beautiful head table for everyone to see you and your new spouse and your friends up at the front, there's a little tiny table in the corner. And as the reception goes on, it gets stranger and stranger and stranger. And then all of the different ceremonies and elements that are normally put into a reception to celebrate the marriage of the bride and groom have been taken to mean something else. There's no fanfare when you come in, but there's massive fanfare when the cake comes in. And there's songs dedicated to the cake. And there's songs dedicated to the meal. And then the best man... And the maid of honor and the groomsmen and the bridesmaids, they get up and they begin giving speeches. But these speeches are not about you. They are not about the bride and groom. They are about their favorite love stories from movies and books. And people bring presents in, but they are not for you. They are not for the bride and groom. That would seem like a weird wedding, wouldn't it? Because that's not what weddings are about. Weddings are about celebrating the marriage of the bride and groom. And so if this happened, I think we would be shocked. We would be surprised. We would say, well, that's barely a wedding. Like, yes, they got married, but this is not a good celebration. Because they're missing the truly wonderful thing that is right in front of them. That they are celebrating, yeah, cake is great. Movies are great, but they are missing the truly wondrous thing that is right in front of them. And that is that this man and this woman have become one and have dedicated their lives to serving the Lord together and to being together. They've missed the truly wonderful thing that's right in front of them. They have taken the trappings of the celebration and have lifted them above the substance of the celebration. And unfortunately, this is often what we do with Christmas. Now, the trappings of the celebration are not bad. There are all sorts of bits and bobs and movies and decorations that we add to our Christmas celebration that are wonderful. They're good memories. They're beautiful. But these are the trappings of a celebration which which has at its core 
the reality of who Jesus is and that Jesus came down to be with us, to accomplish much for us. And yet so often, we get distracted by these other stories and these other characters, and Jesus just sits in the corner. He's a little figurine and a a little tiny nativity set somewhere in the house, but he is not the star of the show. He's not the one we get excited about. Now, I I should be clear, you know, the Bible doesn't explicitly call us to celebrate Christmas, right? There's no verse that says, ye shall celebrate Christmas on December 25th. But it is, does have Christian origins, I would argue that. And if we have an opportunity to celebrate Christ, and we're claiming to celebrate Christ, I think we should do it right. He needs to be in the proper place. So the question is, the question for ourselves is, is our celebration focused on the being who deserves worship or the characters made up so we can buy more stuff? Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And these are verses that we read often around Christmas time. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Here we have a prophecy that was written hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene, before Jesus was born. And it speaks of one who has the government on his shoulders A one who has given many wonderful names. He's not just a little baby in a manger, but he is a king who will rule and will not just rule one throne. Well, he will rule, I guess, one throne, but it is a throne that is over all thrones. He will rule completely and fully. There will be no end to his rule, no end to his power. And this kingdom will not be a tyrannical mess but it will be upheld with justice and with righteousness. This will be a place and a kingdom where what is good holds the kingdom together. And this kingdom will be eternal. And this is accomplished by the zeal of the Lord, the excitement of the living God. It's a lot more than just a manger. It's even a lot more than just the the, the story that we share with people to tell them the gospel. How many of you are frustrated by politics? Mm -hmm. Right? We're glad it's December because it's not November anymore. Finances. Relationship challenges. Health challenges. Loss. Loss. And there, there's struggles in this room that I just don't know anything about. Right? That, and some of you are just in a place that you feel like no one can connect with you. A lot of you going through some really difficult seasons. You know, it's, when, when you're happy, when life is going reasonably well, it's easy to hype yourself up around Christmas with food and with drinks and with characters and decorations, those things, right, they're just icing on the cake. But those things don't really help that much when you're in the pit of despair, right? Those things really don't help that much when life is not going well, when you're facing challenges. And that's why the phrase, God is with us, is so powerful. Because that's more than entertainment. That's a promise. That's a reality. That in our greatest struggles, in our greatest trials, the living God is involved and he has a solution. He is not distant, he is not far off, he is with us. He's not just a life coach, but he is the king of all things. And he will bring ultimate justice in the end. 
I'm sure some of you have probably been in the position where you've been at a wedding and you just haven't really been in the mood. Right? Maybe you've had a bad day, maybe you've had a bad week, a bad year. And so you're not that interested in the food, you're not that interested in dancing, you definitely aren't that interested in whatever songs they're playing. You don't really want to talk to anybody. But even in that moment, you can still experience joy because you're excited about the bride and groom coming together. And isn't that so often the Christian life? There are times where we just can't get hyped up by the trappings of Christmas, the accessories of Christmas, but we can still find joy in the substance, in the center, that God is with us. Jesus is not a side character. Our hope comes from Jesus as the greatest being in existence. Revelation 19, 6 through 9, the passage known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a vision that the Apostle John had. He says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. A theme that we see throughout the whole scripture is the image of marriage. And specifically, marriage as the relationship that God has as the groom with his people, the bride. Now, for those of you that have been in church, church is not perfect. Right? Right? I think so. Uh, you know, it definitely isn't in my experience. But the reality is that throughout all time, God has been gathering people to himself. And he is the one who makes his people clean. He is the one who ultimately uh, frees us of our sin in the end. He's the one who forgives us. He's the one who purifies his people. And so there's this image in the scriptures of God as the groom preparing his bride for the wedding celebration. Now, we often lose track of that image. We don't feel that church is a beautiful place. We don't feel like God's people are unified. We don't feel like God's people are holy. But this is a reality that God is bringing together. And here in Revelation, we just have this little peak. But the beautiful thing is, in the end, the marriage supper actually happens. That there will be a day when all of God's people are gathered to himself and they are pure. And they are clothed, not in actual fabric, but they are clothed in the good deeds of the saints. They are clothed in what God has accomplished through his people. And it is beautiful and it is glorious. We'll all be together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is not a side character. Our hope comes from Jesus as the greatest being in existence. He is the great groom who is preparing his bride for the greatest day in human history. That's the marriage we're looking for. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with all this? I have two little bits of application here. And the first is that we should intentionally make Jesus the focus of worship in our homes, families, and traditions. Intentionally make Jesus the focus of worship in home, family, and traditions. For those of us that especially are parents or are leaders in the home, we have a lot of opportunity in saying, hey, all right, kids, or all right, family, uh, around this specific tradition, we're going to read a passage in relation to Jesus coming. Or we're going to pray. We have decor choices that we can make. We get to decide what we're excited about. 
We decide what movies will be watched. Something we tried just the other day, um, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm the perfect example of being intentional with traditions, but we went to Deck the Halls. Anyone go to that? In Hollis, they had uh, these various trucks and whatnot that were covered in lights at the town hall. And so we were going to Deck Your Halls. Some of you probably have already or will take your kids or your family members. And you'll go look at the lights, the light displays on different subdivisions around here. And so something we did right before we left is we just stopped and we prayed. We said, Lord, help us to remember that you are the light of the world as we look at these beautiful lights. It's actually not hard. It only takes a few moments to bring Jesus into our traditions. To pause the entertainment for a second and remember a deeper meaning behind the entertainment. This is why um, on Christmas, we're going to be making a Christmas special. Well, we're not making it on Christmas, but we will be providing it to you. So it will not just be a normal online service, but we are actually currently filming and producing a Christmas special for you to watch at home Christmas morning. Because what we don't want is for everyone to go, all right, we're just going to stay home and do our normal Christmas thing. And so you wake up and you get really excited about presents and really excited about a certain movie you watch and really excited about the food. At the end of the day, it seems like... Did we talk about that Jesus guy? And I, I'm the guilty one. So often, right, that has been my Christmas experience. And so we want to provide an opportunity to have a tradition that's a little bit entertaining and draws Christ into your Christmas morning. So that's something that we'll be providing for you guys. We don't have all the details on it. We're working on it. Looking at Caleb, we still got stuff to film and whatnot. But that's a wonderful opportunity, especially for those of you who have kids, to sit down Christmas morning and to watch that and draw Christ into your Christmas morning. The second application is to remind one another about the big picture. That Jesus is more than just a nativity story. He is the God who is restoring all things to himself. And that is the true remedy for hardship this season. I know not all of you are facing hardship. Some of you, and you're on cloud nine, you're having a great time, but some of you are not. And so it's our job as brothers and sisters in Christ to remind one another of the big picture, to remind one another, one another of what God is doing in the long term, what he started before time began, and what he will finish in the end. He's purifying his bride. He's drawing his people together. This is what provides hope when our temporary situation is not pleasant, when our temporary situation is a struggle. That we should remind one another of the big picture. Jesus is not a side character. Our hope comes from Jesus as the greatest being in existence. I just have some lyrics to read from an old, old Eastern hymn. So this is probably not a hymn that, that many of you have heard. And I want you to kind of observe as I read through this. It doesn't speak of God necessarily in the same way that we do in often some of our Western hymns. We tend to very much focus in on the gospel, right? Especially as evangelicals, we're all about the gospel, and that's not a bad thing. But this hymn really speaks broadly of the power of God working through humanity and God being with us. It says God is with us. Understand this, O nations, and submit yourselves, for God is with us. Hear this, even unto the uttermost ends of the earth, for God is with us. Submit yourselves, ye mighty ones, for God is with us. If again ye shall rise up in your might, O then shall ye be overthrown, for God is with us. If any take counsel together, them shall the Lord destroy. For God is with us. And the word which you shall speak shall not abide with you. For God is with us. For we fear not your terror, neither are we troubled. For God is with us. But the Lord our God, to him shall we ascribe holiness. And him shall we fear. For God is with us. And if I put my trust in him, he shall be my sanctification for God is with us. I will set my hope on him, and through him shall I be saved, for God is with us. I and the children whom God has given me, 
for God is with us. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, for God is with us. And they that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death shall fear not, for God is with us. For unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, for God is with us. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, for God is with us. And of his peace there will be no end, for God is with us. Let's pray. Lord, help us to remember you in all of our celebrations, to put you at the center of our Christmas celebrations, for you are with us. You are the one we need. We are created to have fellowship with you. And so, Lord, help us to to accept all of the wonderful elements of celebration with gladness and thanksgiving, but may they not become more prominent in worshiping you and remembering who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In these moments, we're going to celebrate communion, also known as the Lord's Supper. This is a symbol that God's people have been practicing for 2,000 years. It's a symbol for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, I would ask that you would not participate in this symbol. Now, it's interesting, kind of on this topic, we can almost think of communion as a rehearsal dinner. Because when we partake in this symbol, we are remembering who Christ is, and we are remembering the unity that God has given his people. And one day we won't need this symbol anymore. I don't think we're going to be in heaven. I don't think we're going to be enjoying the new heavens and the new earth with a tiny little plastic hourglass thing with juice and crackers in it. Because we will be in the very presence of the living God and we will need no symbol like this. And so this is the meal. Very symbolic. It's not a very very filling meal. But it's a meal that allows us to remember who Jesus is and remember the unity that he's given his people. So if you take the, the bread, the cracker, We remember at the Last Supper, Jesus pointed to the suffering that he would endure. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He said that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We are God's covenant people. We've been brought together by an agreement that is sealed and paid for by Jesus' sacrifice. Let's do this in remembrance of Jesus. Lord Jesus, so often I have not given you the glory you deserve. So often I've been distracted by my own pursuits, my own preferences. But you deserve all glory. For you are the being who deserves all glory just because you are. And on top of that, you are restoring all things. 
you have welcomed us back as sons and daughters, and you've you've given us that access by your own sacrifice. Thank you for the unity we have in Christ, the forgiveness we have in Christ. Please bless our Christmas celebrations this year. May they have you at the center of them, and may they be glorifying to you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand together as we close out the service with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.